This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 295 of the Dressage Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network, brought to you by Easy Signs Online and TotalSaddleFit.com. This is Reese Scoffler Stanfield from Wellington, Florida. And this is Philip Parks from Fergus, Ontario, and you're listening to the Dressage Radio Show with just Reese and I. Hi, Philip. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing, Reese? <laughs> I'm doing great. Enjoying the really... Florida weather? Oh, yeah. We, we, we won't talk about the weather because it oh, makes people really yeah, cranky. Yeah, makes people mad. All right. It makes you mad, but um, I will talk about it. It's just been a great week. Really, truly... Um, you just it's really inspiring to be here and you know it inspires you to eat well and inspires you to work out <laughs> ride well ride more i just all the cool things that that we're here for so um we've been really busy and uh, we've had clients in town this week um and then travis is coming to visit me so that'll be really fun i get a uh, husband break which will be nice this weekend and um wonderful yeah so we're going to hear later um, in, in the show, but, you know, I was at the Stephen Clark uh, clinic. I even got my picture with him. Yeah, he's really, nice. yeah, he's a lovely, lovely person. And I tell you what, uh, if you get to see him, he's worth seeing. Uh, it was probably one of my favorite symposiums I've ever been to. Nice. Um, and it's nice to have judges and trainers working together. Uh, so I really enjoyed, I was honestly, I was exhausted. It, it was easier for me to ride all the horses than to sit there and think for the whole day. So that was pretty fun. So Yeah, we, we really know that thinking trip. is hard for you. It is. It's very hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is actually kind of uh, not part of the brain I use so much anymore. And uh, so it was fun to really sit down and, 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 and focus on just training horses and, and how I can be better. So it was great. And a lot of fun. And, and uh, FEI trainer Francesca Nicoletti is going to come on later in the show to talk to us a little bit about her impressions of the symposium. Oh, so. awesome. Well, yeah. we've only got a couple of tidbits on news. Maybe you want to want to bring that up, and then uh, we can get right to the show. Absolutely. That sounds great. Well, Adrian Lyle, um, who at the Olympics World Championships retired her horse, Wizard, um, and this Oldenburg gelding, he is going to retire at their farm in Idaho, uh, owned by their sponsors. Uh, he'll be retired next to Brentina, uh, and he will retire at 16. So it's nice to hear that he will spend the rest of his days Chilling out. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I guess, the, I mean, their plans were to retire him this year. She was hoping to make the World Cup finals in Las Vegas because uh, the, the stadium where they hold the, the show is, uh, is named after their sponsor. So mm-hmm. that would have been kind of cool. But I guess he suffered some small tendon injury and, and that's not going to happen. So um, right. that would have been really nice for her. But he had a long, you know, long career and, and a very yes. successful career for the U.S. team. And um and we wish him well in in the paddock in retirement. Absolutely, I want to I want to hang out and join him. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> You're not ready to retire yet. You gotta yeah, stay here on the radio exactly. with me. Exactly. True. True. Okay. <laughs> and then the rest of the news we have today is Elizabeth Williams was elected the chair of the USEF High Performance Dressage Committee, and um, I Elizabeth is really she's a technical delegate and has been in the sport. Well, as long as, as long as I've been in the sport, and she's a wonderful person, and I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what she does with that committee. So we wish her luck and uh, thank Janet Foy for all the time she put into the committee herself. So that was that was um, sad and exciting news at the same time. So all right, cool, cool. Yeah, exactly. Well, right after this commercial break, we are going to come back um, with our favorite Hillary Moore Hebert. Uh, she's the contributing editor to Dressage Today, and she's going to be fantastic and give all the tips uh, that we need for the month. Easy Signs Online is the official sign company of the Horse Radio Network. This week's product highlight are their personalized nameplates. Perfect for horse stalls, tack rooms, lockers, bedroom doors, dog kennels, or whatever you can think of. Choose from hundreds of online graphics to further customize the nameplates from EasySignsOnline.com. Made from one half inch thick solid PVC signboard, these colorful and unique one sided nameplates are three and a half inches by 16 inches 
and are designed for durability, long-term indoor or outdoor use. They are only $39.95 each, and remember, free shipping on most orders over $100. Visit them at EasySignsOnline.com. Well, it's been a long time, but we have contributing editor for our Dressage Today, Hilary Moore Hebert, on it, um, to give us some talk about uh, what's going on with the magazine and some of the topics that are included in the magazine and uh, some great tips that we can talk about. Hi, Hilary. Hi. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Right? I, we haven't talked in a while. I am doing great. I am freezing. We just had our typical um, mid-Atlantic snow that was an inch and a half and yesterday we had five cars driving off of the road on the way to the barn so um oh, that's awful. i am glad it's already melted and we're back to you know almost spring so i'm really looking forward to the show season starting and it for it to get a little bit warmer but i do have some tips that you can do even if it's too cold to ride because i know not everyone like reese is down in florida enjoying <laughs> the warm weather yeah, no kidding. Hey, we're all we all made to suffer so for some reason, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least this winter hasn't been as bad as the last. And uh, who knows? You never know when it's going to end, right? Yeah. Well, that's great. So maybe we should get right get right into the tips and the topics. What's our What's our first one? Okay, so I wanted to talk about um, the core because I think that that is something that is very. Uh, difficult to understand. Some people think of it as just your abdominals because of some of the exercise crazes that are going around. But really, it's, you know, the whole girdle of your torso, and everyone talks about it in riding, but no one really talks about how to find it properly. And I wanted to talk about um, Rebecca Ashton's article on engaging the core, and she has uh, a neat way of talking about how to find your core. So, um, You can either lay on your back with your knees bent and your feet flat on the floor, or you can do this on your hands and knees. But she suggests, you know, kind of being on your hands and knees like your back is flat like a table or laying on your back and feeling like you have like a hipster belt on. And then you want to feel as though when you engage your core that you're trying to tighten the belt to the third hole. So that you're engaging 30% of your core muscles and your pelvis um, so that you're not doing it so much that you feel like you're being strangled. It's more like you're just pulling it in 30%. Um, at the same time, you can also imagine lifting up your pelvis like um, an elevator. So it's like you're activating the floor of your pelvis. Um, and that if there were 10 levels, you'd want to imagine the level going up. So it's going up to the third floor. So again, um, you don't want to feel as though you're like tying yourself up and so restricted that you can't breathe. You just want to feel like everything kind of draws in a little bit. And, um, I thought that that was an interesting idea because it, it talks about, a lot of those internal muscles, it's not just those big abdominals, those big back muscles, it's all those little muscles inside that hold all your organs and whatnot, um, you know, that kind of pulls everything in together. So I liked that as a, a, a exercise to do to kind of feel that feeling. I think that's good. I think for sure people get into a really, you know, overdoing it and, and becoming a little bit too strong. And then they I think I think people tend to, you know, strain their back, you know, really pushing their body so much in that they they cause a little bit a little bit of pain, you know, like if if the riding, you know, if the riding is so much that it's you know, you can't catch your breath or or you're or you know, you cause things to hurt, then it's probably not right. So I think every little tip and exercise that that we can bring to people that really helps understand, you know, about that some passive engagement or some positive tension instead of really, you know, going, going a little bit too far with it, that, that, that's a good thing. And, and, uh, you know, I like the idea of the visuals and, and all these great tips from the magazine that help with that. And I like how she says to both do it on your hands and knees and on your back, because do you notice too, when you're teaching that sometimes whether people mean to or not, 
they'll activate their core and either crunch down so that their back is rounded yeah. or they'll use just their back so that it's really arched. And you can see there's like a, you know, huge difference in the way that they're sitting um, because they're not engaging all of those muscles, even though maybe they are doing it on, you know, and trying to engage all the muscles, they still are doing something where they're, you know, overdoing one side or the other. Yeah, I, I, find, I tend to find the one, you know, where they're really overarching their lumbar section the biggest one and the biggest problem because you know it just really you know it tilts the pelvis and you know puts people on, you know more on their crotch really than on their on their butt and so the other way you know not so much i think you know what i try and tell people is that if anything they go a little bit round with their back rather than really pressing that back so far you know really using their their back and their pelvis more than their more than their um abdominal muscles so yeah, I mean, for sure, you find people going one way. You know, everybody goes one way or the other, right? Nobody's perfect. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, the next tip that I have is sort of in the same um, idea of doing an unmounted exercise and finding your balance. But this now it starts to incorporate the rest of your body. And it's in Suzanne Von uh section called The Clinic, which... She does every month, and I love her, and I want her to come and move into my house and just talk to me every <laughs> and single night. And help you every day, yeah. That yeah, the good. stuff that she does is tips. It's like I feel as though I've never known anything about dressage until I read her article. Um, so she talks about encouraging balance and lightness, and I really like this exercise. She has you stand in front of a wall with your knees slightly bent as you would in riding position while holding your arms as if you're holding reins. Um, and you want to stand at a distance that you can touch the wall with your knuckles it, with your arms still at an angle as if you were riding. Now, the next thing you're supposed to do is push very gently against the wall, starting with the bottom of your, your hand so that your pinky finger is the first to touch the wall. And feel what's happening in your body as you do this. So what should happen, and this might be an exercise to do after the core exercise, is you should feel that your shoulders move down, your abdominal muscles become active, and then you'll start to, again, feel those core muscles activate the rest of your torso. And your weight will shift down your back towards your heels. So this forward push of the hand is similar to the giving and yielding of the hands at the end of every half halt. And um, this shows that the motion of giving is followed by sitting deeper with more core stability in a longer leg position. So it starts to show you how that core stability helps you in lengthening your leg, allowing your arms to be elastic and following. Um, And what you can then do is then when you get onto your horse is imagine that same feeling. So you're kind of thinking about that elasticity while your torso stays in balance. Um, and I just thought that that was a really neat exercise. This is cool. You know, I'm sitting down right now, but I really want to kind of get up and try this, you know? Um, I, yeah, Suzanne Von Dietz, she's got, you know, just re- really refreshing perspective and, and a great, uh, a great teaching style and a lot of, you know, physiology, anatomy that comes, in, comes into her, her teaching about the body and its motion and stuff. So I'm excited to try this. I'm going to do it right after we, right after we finish this interview. <laughs> I like, to that idea, and I think not a lot of people outside of the riding world do this, but when she talks about that exercise, there's sort of that, um, that elasticity between your shoulder blades that I think that that starts to give you that feeling for, so you have more adjustability in your shoulder um, that I think is something, you know, you need to learn as a rider, but is a new concept to a lot of people who are new to the riding world. And so I just, I like that a lot because it kind of shows how you can be flexible in a really three-dimensional way in your shoulders and your shoulder blades. So Yeah, for sure. And all the exercises, like you said, when it's cold out, we can do all this stuff, you know, without a horse. And then you don't have the interference of the horse's motion or whatever they're deciding to, you know, maybe it's a crazy, windy, snowy day and they're jumping around. You know, you just really can focus on, on yourself, on the riding and on position stuff you know, to help you when you actually do get on the horse and, you know, and then not, not a, everyone really rides six, five, six days a week. So uh, I think, um, you know, we can really appreciate all the, all these great tips and exercises uh, about unmounted stuff. So great. What's, what else and do we I, have? What's next? 
Yeah, so this one actually does include your horse. So in case you are <laughs> brave enough to go out or if you're like racing down in Florida, um, and it talks about your horse's balance. So especially in the corners, this can relate. Imagine that there's a scale under each of your horse's feet and think about him putting equal weight onto each scale as he takes each footstep so that there's not too much on the inside front, um, you know, that he's staying balanced as he comes around corners. He's not leaning too much on the inside legs so that he just stays more upright and balanced over all four of his legs. And um, Lauren Samus did that for the solutions. There's a really nice visual to go with it that um, Sandy Rabinowitz drew and, um, I just think that that's a really neat way and very easy way to think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, especially uh, um, apparent when I was teaching a lesson yesterday, you know, uh, about the weight on left shoulder, right shoulder. And, you know, most people can kind of f get it when you're on a straight line. But when you're, you're on a circle, you should have pretty similar feeling, you know, when you bend the horse that they don't rest all their weight on the inside shoulder for a lot of horses or the outside shoulder for the you know the more that you ride them and the more that you train them it's all about really getting the horse to distribute the weight um off of the shoulders or at least evenly in each shoulder and more onto the hind legs and that's something that we got to think about you know um on at first a 20 meter circle and then on the smaller circles and then even as you're you're, you're moving across the arena in in leg yield or, you know, as you go sideways in leg yield or half pass, that they don't overweight, you know, one shoulder. I think we see it a lot in uh, the sideways motion because, you know, we're really driving the horse towards, you know, an outside rein or an outside leg and, and the horse becomes very heavy on one side. Whenever you're teaching the horse something or you, you strive to continue to have that equal weight um, in every movement, every exercise, and that's how you can really get the horse to to elevate the shoulders and, and, and get them really working correctly and, and not going, you know, sideways one way or the other way with with a heavy usually it's a front leg, usually a really heavy outside front leg. So that's something that's something to think about and a great visual for for our listeners and riders. Mm -hmm. So my last tip comes from an article called How to Embrace Incompetence that my friend Eliza Sudnor Rom wrote. And um, I love her. I've actually uh, been um, doing training stuff and run into her with a bunch of different things um, and even knew her back when she was helping at Averett organize the, um, the uh, USDF Instructor for Certification Program. So um, I think that she has a really neat way of approaching things. And her article um, talks about this concept that was developed by Noel Birch, um, who was working with Dr. Thomas Gordon in the 70s about the four stages of learning, and she really applies it to dressage. Um, but I, I really like that she brought that up because this, um, this idea is something that I use in my own training quite a lot. And what it is is that it says there's four stages of learning. So you start out saying that you have unconscious and incompetence. So you don't know that you don't know how to do something. And this right. starts out like, for example, someone who's just come into riding, they don't even understand that there's the concept of, you know, riding leg yield. So they don't even know what they're thinking about. Then there's conscious incompetence. You know that you don't know how to do something and it bothers you. So that's, you know, coming in and you have leg yield and it's presented to you, but, you know, in your first lesson you try to do it and it's not working. Right. Then there's conscious competence, and you know that you know how to do something, but it requires effort. So, for example, you know you're supposed to be sitting straight, but you tend to get crooked. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but you're making progress. And then at the end, we finish with unconscious competence, and that's you know how to do something so well that it becomes second nature. And that's like, you know, Stephen Peters riding half pass. So, um we go through all those stages, but I think it's really good to know that because I think as riders at every level, it's very important for us to be aware that being frustrated is actually a good sign. It means that the more that you recognize that you can't do, the closer you are to being able to do it automatically because you at least are aware of what needs to happen. You just haven't gotten there yet. So I think that that's a really neat way to look at things because it reminds you that in the you know worst times it actually means that you're progressing 
Yeah, I think I think we're all kind of stuck in that unconscious or the conscience um, incompetence sort of thing. I mean, with my own horses, uh, for sure. I mean, I've been working hard to to ride well and uh, for a lot of years. But even though I, you know, like I know how to ride and I know how to ride leg yield or you know something for the basics. I think you know in dressage we just you're always 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 trying to make the the basic things better and better and better. You know, a lot of times I end up just riding. The horses, it doesn't matter what the level of the horse is, it's just, you know, walk, trot, canter, just really looking for the really good transitions, really good gates, and really good balance, you know. So I don't know if we ever get to the point of, of not trying to work on those things and, and uh, you know, and, and not getting better like that. So, you know, even if you're uh, um, an inter- intermediate rider who is, doesn't do it professionally, you know, is, is amateur, you're working on the same stuff that everybody is working on, you know, like you never get to a point of where, you know, Oh, I just sit on the horse and it does everything perfectly. You're always, always, always working on it. So, you know, I, yeah, I really love, uh, Eliza. She's got a great sense of humor and, and that's a great way to approach things. And, and, um, like you said, at first you, you don't know what you don't know. And as long as you're working towards learning and 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 you know getting all the access to information that you can that's you're going to get better right Mm -hmm. and and you always have the toughest times right before you know it clicks for sure and that's that's great motivation to be able to just to go out there and try your best every day so i love that idea of the article and to talk about it and to say yeah we all get frustrated right we all have the days where you feel like oh i just i'm not getting it right you know even even professional writers get that every single day. So Yeah, and I definitely feel like that that to me this is what I remind myself every time I think of the tempi changes and my trainer can tell you this. Everything else I feel as though I progress. The tempi changes, you know, they're fine and they they're always fine, but I feel as though if I don't practice them for a while or, you know, I am on a new horse or I'm starting to count to, you know, doing ones or twos when I was comfortable with threes or fours, that is like my Achilles heel with this. And I stay in that conscious incompetence level for much longer, you know, versus some of the other movements at the same level where you kind of think that you're never, ever, ever going to learn it and you lay awake thinking about it. And then, you know, going to your first show, you kind of obsess about it, thinking you're never going to do it. But, um, you know, as someone who now has gotten the changes, I promise there is an end to all of it. There is never a a time that you're just going to be stuck not being able to do something forever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, like you said, you always, you you get really obsessive about like, oh, it could be better, could be better, could be better. Well, it turns out it probably always can get better, right? You know, whether it's we're riding for in a show for a score or whether we're riding at home, I, you know, you always feel like, Oh, you know, that was pretty good, you know, but it just, you know, you just always are looking for that intangible thing to make it feel like it was perfect. And mm-hmm. I don't know if I ever, yeah, I ever felt like, oh, that was a perfect line of changes or that was a perfect half pass or I just always think, you know, and that's what makes us, you know, perfectionists and dressage riders is about, you know, always, always looking to just improve the little things and, and, uh, you know, it gets better. You know, it's, it's like you have to remind yourself if I watch a videotape of, me and a specific horse doing a particular movement now and then six months from now, I know it gets better. Even if the feeling is like, oh, you know, it's just not perfect. We're, yeah, just it's it's okay to be obsessive, but it's not okay to really be negative about it. So, yeah, that's I mean that's why we use a lot of videotaping, and you know, we go back and look at look at tests from from last year and and say, you know what, a lot of, a lot of times it has gotten better, but just because we're all you know, maybe a little A type or just really obsessive about it. That uh, that uh, you know, we get down on ourselves, but you don't you don't have to. It, it'll be okay, right? It always gets better. Yeah, it's never perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, Hillary, thank you for joining me today and uh, giving us the tips from Dressage today. How can uh, people find more information about the magazine and about about the tips that you put out? So everything we talked about is in the January issue. Um, they can also check everything out, including um, some exciting things related to World Cup this year at dressagetoday.com, as well as finding articles and fun things on our Facebook page, uh, Twitter, and Pinterest, and YouTube. So check us out. Great. Well, thanks for coming on, and we'll talk to you real soon.
Well, as always, we love Hillary, and she does a phenomenal job. Uh, and right after this commercial break, we're going to come back with FEI writer and trainer Francesca Nicoletti about her takeaways from the Stephen Clark Clinic. Hey, this is Gina Moronic from Wisconsin, and I am an official Horse Radio Network auditor, something I'm really proud to do and to be a part of in a small way because it's something that I get a lot of information from. The Horse Radio Network uh, and the convenience of the downloadable podcasts means that I can improve my horsemanship skills, my riding skills, um, or just really enjoy listening to friendly, informative programming whenever I'm driving to work or working on chores or at the barn even. So I hope you find it as enjoyable as I do. If you do, go to horseradionetwork.com and click on the banner to become a Horse Radio Network auditor. For as little as a dollar a month, you can be involved in this great thing too and keep it going. Thanks. Well, this evening, it is my pleasure to have my friend and colleague, Francesca Nicoletti. She is a bronze, silver, and gold medalist, along with a bronze, silver, and gold freestyle barn medalist. She has all of them. And she's here from, she's in uh, Wellington, Florida right now, but from Canton, Ohio. And we spent the last couple days at the Stephen Clark USDF Trainers Conference. So, Francesca, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. (laughs) Well, we are so happy to have you, and let's jump right in. What were sort of your overall impressions of the last couple days? I felt, at first, I was a little disappointed they didn't have a rider. I thought, oh, a different format, and it was incredible. I couldn't have been more happy. Um, They did tests. He critiqued tests with scores and and what someone of of Mr. Clark's caliber wanting from us competitors and teachers, it was wonderful. I couldn't have asked for more. So was there an overall theme to the to his ideas and what he was trying to get across to the to the spectators? I would say he started a lot about the quality and the basic gait, his paces. He was on and on about how important the three bases paces and the purity of the gates, which we all strive to have from the beginning, um, straightness with that, and then basically exercises to achieve this, transitions, lots and lots of transitions. Um, but that was the, the biggest thing that I took right away from the beginning was that purity of the three gates. And then it, of course, evolved into more contact, uh, more movement as we went up the levels with the different tests. And Francesca, I agree with you. I thought I was also a little bit skeptical. I thought, no, I don't know. I, but mm-hmm. Stephen Clark has judged uh, both of us and Philip as well, and he is a phenomenal judge. And so I thought, you know, I, I really want to go and hear what he has to say. Um, because, again, that at the end of the day, we all have to show and have be judged. And here's one of the best judges, if not one of the best judges in the world right at our fingertips. And that was one of the things that I really noticed throughout the whole uh, just conference was how particular he was on basics. And it didn't matter if it was a Grand Prix, international Grand Prix horse, because we saw one, Mm -hmm. uh, to the junior rider. And, and, And they did a lovely job picking literally a wide range of FEI horses, which was also... That's something. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but that's no, something please. right away that I think kudos to them. Sometimes you go and you see these horses that just blow your hair back and you think, this isn't the normal. You know, how is this going to help me when I'm working with a, you know, a quarter horse thoroughbred who has very mediocre gates? How is this going to help me when I see this international horse? And there were like you said, international horse. There were some really interesting, um, the Hackney, mm-hmm. you know, there's a very unusual mm-hmm. breed. I mean, trained beautifully. And he really, what I loved is he said, you know, it doesn't matter the breed of the horse. It matters the correctness that the horse was trained well, that he was presented to his best. And boy, was it nice to hear a judge say that not, oh, well, this horse is not in style or whatnot. 
Oh, I to- I completely agree with you. And it, it was neat because we did. We saw a, an FEI hackney, which I I don't think mm-hmm. I've ever seen before. Um, but he in 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 basically, you know, not everybody, but certain people ha- were would write a test. So they would come in and they would be relatively warmed up. They would write a test. And then he would basically judge the test over the microphone. Kudos to those riders. Uh, I don't know if I yeah. would have done it. <laughs> they, uh, you know, they, they had to hear what the judge was saying that they did wrong or well uh, as they were going along. Mm-hmm. And they were great sports. Uh, but then he would pick they the were. theme. They really were. Um, and, and then he would pick the theme and then work on that theme. And then the second day they came back. Um, so did you see kind of... Uh, when he would pick a theme, did you f- see a theme that was pretty overarching between all of the horses? Um, you know, he always addressed the contact, and I think he called it the contact point, which he basically said it was the same as the contact. He thought that was very important with all the different horses to make sure the contact was good, the pull was the highest point, um, the gates were pure, and striving in the different tests, I appreciated. He said, you know, it's so difficult to keep the tempo the same in the lateral work, the collected and the extended, not have such a variation in the tempo. And it was just, I thought that he stayed very true to. And he was very quick to say, you know what, that was great. And he was quick to say, you know, this can be better. This is how it needs to be better. And this is what we can do to raise to get the point. And that I appreciated because you sometimes, you know, you get a six and no, nothing, you know, no comments. What do you do? How do I get an eight? Et cetera. Oh, I, I agree. And, and he did a phenomenal job with that. He really did. He said, okay, mm-hmm. you know, that would have been an eight, but there was an issue with the contact. And, mm-hmm. um, I, I, he did. He talked a lot about this contact point and you also talked about a lot with transitions. He did, more transitions, which has really, it really influenced me. I came back the, after the conference and rode a few horses and my goodness, we did a lot of transitions because he was so big on that. <laughs> yeah. You know, he was big on the transitions mm-hmm. and he was big on the half halt. Um, and he had a golden rule that if you rode a half halt and it didn't work, you needed to ride a transition right after. And I thought that was a pretty right. cool golden rule. Mm-hmm. I, I, I like yeah, that's, that's a really like good that. tip, right? Mm-hmm. His golden rule. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen Stephen Clark before, and um, what I really like is the format of having a judge sit there, comment, and have to explain themselves. Because we talk a lot about, um, you know, being able to understand the test as we watch. So I think it's really great to have a judge, you know, comment and talk about it, and you know, we talk about each movement, but you know, and the test overall. You know, I like the format, and 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 we use this um, in my local dressage club. We'll have, you know, you don't need an Olympic O judge to be able to do this. You can you can bring a judge that you use, you know, during during your lo- local shows or whatever that can come out and give this type of clinic. We like to do it, especially, you know, as you're coming into the season. You know, about you know for new riders just coming into dressage and and having to figure out, okay, you know, and and uh, kind of breaking people into what it is to ride a test. And also a few seasoned competitors where they need to just, you know, sharpen their eye up or have some things explained to them, at a, you know, on a very, you know, basic level about contact, about the gates, about each transition, what the judges wanted to see. I think it's really great and super educational, you know, over some, some types of clinics where you have a rider come in there and deal with one horse and one person. And, you know, because we know that, you know, not all horses and riders have the same problems. So you end up dealing with, you know, maybe eight, maybe 10 riders over the day and we say okay well that's how to you know that's how to deal with that horse or this horse and you say yeah this is not the not the horse i have at home you know whereas you know when you're dealing with a judging thing and, and an overall thing you know we have a goal for all the horses that go in front of a judge and you know how the transition should be written so again i just really love that format and and uh, we try and use it and you know at the grassroots level more than even the upper upper echelons of the sport to really help people understand and and make judging and riding and showing transparent and explain it right down Mm -hmm. to the basics. So that, I mean, that was, that's my two cents on, on the format and how, why I thought this would be really interesting this year at the trainers conference. I agree. I hope it has a snowball effect and people do like you referred to the ride a test format. 
I've done a couple in my area with just low level and, you know, spend the time. We'd write a test, I'd critique it, then we'd say, okay, how do we make it better? And then we do it again. Yeah, and yeah the two-day format the works for that really well. Is huge. Yeah, the response is huge. And I believe that, you know, and also, you know, inspiring to people. And I felt very inspired after I, watching him I, for two days. I did too. And he's just a kind man and he's kind to the horses mm-hmm. and he really is mm-hmm. big into re- reward and letting them stretch. Yeah, he's kind I to mean, the people as well. I mean, because and, and we, the people. you hate to, mm-hmm. you know, you hate to be in front of a judge that, I mean, their job is to critique you, but when you take them out of the box a little bit, you find that judges are cool and they're trainers and they're, mm-hmm. you know, they are positive mm-hmm. people. You, you know, you always feel a little bit, you know, being in a test a little bit like oh, only the negative is coming through. But when you get somebody to stand there and explain right. themselves and say, yeah, for sure, I don't hate your horse. I don't hate your riding. You just need to tweak it a little bit and you can go for those sevens, eights, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's that's really inspiring as well. Right. Yeah, no, I felt it felt like it as well. So Francesca, what would be your overall sort of takeaway from the clinic? I think, you know, Going to the quality, like it kind of just starting at the beginning with the basics, making sure that is good. Trying to encourage some ride a test in my area when I go home, I think that would be very helpful. Um, thinking about on a personal level when I'm riding a test, okay, how do I get that eight? Okay, is that nine possible? Um, okay, that was a well deserved five. You know, that kind of thing and trying to take it to myself and then share it, share it with others. Um, and just the different exercises. He had many different exercises. You know, we could go through in the half pass to the straight line to the half pass, et cetera. Um, I thought there were many good exercises that helped improve. Um, the thing that I take is I ride some Baroque horses, um, is the pull. The pole being the highest place, making sure that the reason the pole is the highest place is because of what's going on behind. And I loved, absolutely loved his demonstration. If you remember, many riders have said, how do you bring their pole up? And nobody wanted to say, it's your hand. <laughs> you know, yeah. and I love that because that is so human. And I, I like that. And I, you know, I hope to use that in a good way, saying it's okay, you know, to move your hand a bit. But, he um, really did stress that. That was that was good. You know, he, mm-hmm. he he did. He even tested that. He said, you know, he had someone come in that they clearly had been out, you know, getting the horse ready. They weren't listening to the symposium. And he said, you talk mm-hmm. to everybody about raising the pole. And they'll mm-hmm. say, well, I need more activity behind. I need to get them more through the back. And nobody says, hey, come on, <laughs> lift your hand and bring the pole up. And then he brought one of the riders in who happened to be a sweet young rider, did a very good job. And she she fell right for the trap. Which was good, you know, because uh-huh. it's we all do that. We would all say that. I would say that. And he said, "No, come on, mm-hmm. you gotta lift your hand." And and it doesn't make it. It's not a bad word to lift that hand and right. kick the horse on a little bit. And I did like that. And and I really liked. Um, we did get to see Shelly Francis and one of her young superstars, which was phenomenal and just wowed the whole crowd. Uh, but uh-huh. she did an amazing job setting up for the canter pirouettes. And mm-hmm. I saw that. Oh, she yes. Set up for a can. She got a, t- like, I have now seen a 10 pirouette. I'm not sure I've ever seen one in person before. But she mm-hmm. came in. She set up on the line. When she was ready to turn the pirouette, she turned the pirouette. And it, just mm-hmm. to see her set up for that particular mm-hmm. movement was a stunner. And you said, okay, well, clearly I'm not been, I've not been riding that that way. So, you know, so that mm-hmm. was really fun. And to hear him say, Set up for the pirouette on the line. Makes total sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would like to say that mm-hmm. I've been doing that. but mm. So, uh, right. you know, I I will say just an overall, for me, I was really sad that there weren't more people there. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I think the trainers conference is a really, really great way for us all in the United States to get together and talk. And uh, so I wish there had been more people because uh, I really think they would have gotten everybody from the judges, from the trainer's standpoint. So that was my only thing was I was just sad there weren't more people. Uh, but mm-hmm. it, the people who were there got a wonderful, really, really a truly, that was my, probably my favorite trainer's conference I've ever attended. So, um, yep. so I really enjoyed it. So. 
Fantastic. Well, Francesca, I can't thank you enough for your time this evening and coming on the show and telling us about the Trainers Conference. Uh, if our listeners want to find you online, how do they get in touch with you? Um, I'm on Facebook. That Fantastic. Might be, or, yeah, that might be the easiest. I kind of have a small boutique training business. I don't do a lot of advertising or anything like that, but I think you could find me through Facebook. Fantastic. Well, Francesca, thanks for your time, and we look forward to having you on the show again. Oh, thank you so much to both of you. Well, I know Francesca and I learned a lot this week, and all the trainers that went to the USC, USDF uh, Succeed Trainers Conference, and I'm glad that they put it on this year. It was a fantastic event. And now we're going to move right into Justin from Total Saddle Fit for our Total Saddle Fit Tip of the Week. One of the most common and dangerous saddle fit concerns is the restriction of the shoulder's freedom to move. Some saddles slide over the shoulder blade while riding, some permanently rest on the top of the shoulders, and some pinch behind the shoulders, which inhibits full movement and leads to soreness and poor conformation. Short of buying an entirely new saddle, what can you do to give your horse the comfort to freely move his shoulders and perform at his highest potential? The saddle fit solution you have been waiting for is finally here. TotalSaddleFit.com is proud to introduce the shoulder relief girth. This strategically shaped girth actually moves the girth line of your saddle back over one inch, thereby freeing your horse's shoulders from the saddle. Traditional girths pull saddles up against a horse's shoulders and often over the top of the shoulders. The shoulder relief girth's recessed ends allow for the billets to buckle into the girth farther back to give your horse unparalleled freedom of motion. An added bonus to the shoulder relief girth's unique design is the elbow comfort feature. The recessed ends designed for saddle fit now relieve pressure for elbow comfort as well. Similar girths can be purchased for over $275. But thanks to the enormous popularity of the shoulder relief girth, we are able to offer them for only $124.95. We are so certain that your saddle will fit better and your horse will be more comfortable that for a limited time we are offering a 30-day, 110% money-back guarantee. If you are not totally satisfied with your shoulder relief girth, send it back for a full refund plus 10% of the purchase price. Don't wait. Order now for the best saddle fit solution available. And I'm so pleased that Justin from Total Saddle Fit is here again to answer listener questions about saddles and saddle fitting for our horses. How are you doing today, Justin? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? I'm doing just fabulous this afternoon. We've been getting emails very regularly from listeners about saddles and saddle fits. So today we're going to help out Claire Asen who alf- who asks this question. Hello, Philip and Reese and Justin. Love the show. We like it when they start out with that. I would like to submit a question for the Total Saddle Fit Challenge. I have really enjoyed the segments about saddle fit. However, I don't think the issue I have with my horse has been addressed. My question is, what do you recommend for a horse with an uphill build, high withers, and flat back, which results in the saddle slipping back instead of forward? I've tried many different saddles and have never found one that stays forward where I want it to be, resulting in always feeling a little bit behind the motion or balance point. Oh boy, this is going to be a good one. Thanks very much, Claire. What can you help? This sounds like a, it's not all that uncommon a problem amongst folks who ride um, perhaps uphill build thoroughbred or thoroughbred crosses or folks riding saddlebreds. So I bet you there's a lot of listeners out there whose ears are perking right now. Well, great. Well, then let's uh, let, let's let's help them find some answers here. So, you know, one one little I'd like to start with one little comment uh, coming from a saddle fitting background is that I I find a lot of um, saddles are oftentimes placed too far forward to begin with. Uh, you know, inhibiting the the horse's shoulders when the saddle is girthed up. Something just to keep an eye on because uh, you know, sadly, I see it more frequently than not. But I. I I've, uh, I've heard I, other I, saddle I fitters say the same thing, Justin. <laughs> oh, okay, good. So I'm not, I'm not the only one. No, and, you are uh, not. The, I've actually is, heard is, saddle manufacturers say that, and it's in disciplines across the board. Everybody puts their yeah. saddle too far forward. So that's a good point to bring up. 
Definitely. And, you know, I don't think this is Claire's case, but I just wanted to mention that overall that um, it's something to keep an eye on, you know, make sure, they're, make sure their shoulders have some space to move. Um, but as far as fitting these high wither flat back uh, uphill horses, there's, a, there's kind of three things to look at is, as I see it. And the first and most, Im- well, the first and um, top two in, in importance is what we call the head of the tree. So that's the front, the pommel of the tree. And these high weather horses, you run into a lot of trouble when you have kind of more old school saddles or, or saddles that aren't, that aren't designed for them in that they have very short tree points, meaning the distance from the top of the pommel to the end of the, of the saddle tree in the front is very short. And that does not allow enough space for the saddle to make contact low enough on the horse's body. And you end up kind of pinching on either side of the withers and it gives, it gives them no space. It can, it can let the saddle rest on top of the withers can cause a lot of problems that way. So a lot of newer style saddles have factored this in, um, but it's still certainly something to, to keep an eye on is that if you have a high weather horse, no matter what, you want a saddle with long tree points. That will give you way more flexibility in being able to keep the wither area free, keep, it, keep the saddle away from the shoulders, keep it from west resting on top of the withers. Um, that's the biggest thing. So and if the horse changes, by the way, um, being able to adjust it narrower and wider, you'll actually be able to get some adjustability in there without um, without hitting the withers. So long tree points in the front of the saddle is the first thing to uh, to keep an eye on. The now, would just be, quick question oh, from the ahead. consumer's point of view. That's a question you need to pose to your trusted saddle fitter because that's not something you can just turn the flap of the saddle up and look you were, you know, standing in the You're tax right. shop looking at saddles. That's something you need to to get the professional advice on. Yeah, you can, definitely professional advice is, is a huge help there. There are sort of like um, rule of thumb ways to check that, which is if you were to compare two saddles, maybe did a little internet research and, and figured out what saddles are good for high weather horses and which aren't, or which have high long tree points and which don't. And if you were able to go to your local tax store and pick up a couple of used saddles to try out, it would be pretty obvious which one was more um, conducive to high withers because you'd notice how much more space around the whole underside of the pommel there really is around the wither. So above them and to either side, um, just kind of that, that hands-on experimentation or, or testing will get you part of the way there. And then on top of that, you know, if you have, uh, if you have access to a good saddle fitter, then that would be huge as well. Got it. Um, so the, the next thing too is in the panels and in the panels, in the rear part of the saddle panels, there is a, like a little side piece of leather that kind of looks like a triangle. When you look at the saddle from the side, it's called the rear gusset. And that area is where, um, it, it just, it, the thickness of that, whether it's an inch tall or three inches tall determines how much lift it has in the back of the saddle and how much wool you can put in the panels. So when you have a horse that's uphill and has a flat back, a couple things can happen. One, a saddle can have a tendency to sink down low behind, and that's going to put the rider into a chair seat. It's going to make the saddle unstable. And along with that, it can also make the saddle kind of rock and shift around and, and scoot on you, you know, scoot back on you if you're not careful. So I would suggest to look for a saddle that has what we call a deep rear gusset, meaning that, that the, the height of the panels, when you look at the saddle from the side, is very tall in the rear. Because that will allow, that will give uh, enough space to lift the back of the saddle up with the wool to make it level on the horse and stable. And that's going to be huge, huge, huge in keeping the saddle from moving around. Instability and, and, and imbalance are some of the biggest reasons saddles move around. And having that deeper rear gusset will give you the freedom to, um, to compensate for that the most possible. Huh. Fascinating stuff. Um, well, there you and, go, Claire. Is there more? <laughs> One little quick comment I could add is um, just something to check on it with billets as well. Anytime your billet line, um, as you as you compare it to the ground, is not perpendicular to the ground, that can pull your saddle one direction or the other. So if you find that's the case, there's um, birth options that can that can straighten that out, um, and there's also saddle center options that can that can move billets around to make sure they're perpendicular to the ground, um, to make sure you know to make sure that's not actually pulling your saddle forward or backward. Um, but that would be the last thing. So when your saddle is sitting on your horse's back and your horse is standing square on level ground, you should be able to 
lift the flap up and those billets should just naturally hang perpendicular to the ground. Yes. And I will, I will add to that in that when it's girthed up, you like them to be perpendicular to the ground. They should stay that way. Because, <laughs> okay. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Because it's a lot of times what you'll find, and this, to be honest, is more common for saddle sliding forward, but you'll find um, if, the, if the billets angle forward or angle backward when they're girthed up, mm-hmm. it's going to naturally pull the saddle in that direction. So it's just kind of something that is working against you for trying to get your saddle to stay in place. Interesting stuff. Well, thanks again, Justin, and thanks for writing in, Claire. Well, as always, we love email and Facebook shout-outs. We've got a couple we need to get to, and we know we will, but keep them coming. And we still have a great one uh, about rider fitness, so uh, we'll be talking uh, about that as the new year has come along. Uh, but as always, you can find our show notes and links to today's guests on our website, dressageradio.com. Like us on Facebook, just search Dressage Radio Show. Follow us on Twitter at Horse Radio. My website is maplecrestfarmky.com and my email is reese at horseradionetwork.com. You can find me at philipparksequestrian.com and my email, as always, is philip at horseradionetwork.com. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week, totalsaddlefit.com and Easy Signs Online. And don't forget to check out all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. Everybody, keep your heels down and your shoulders back, and we'll talk to you next week. 